Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those um, joining also on YouTube, on the YouTube live stream to our seventh NIAC Equity and Inclusion webinar. Um, and it's an absolute great honor and privilege to be introducing Dr. Tana Joseph, our first Equity and Inclusion Officer of the Netherlands Astronomy Equity and Inclusion Committee, which has been advising the Netherlands Astronomy Council. So I'd just like to say a few words of introduction about Tana. Um, Tana, Dr. Joseph is a South African astronomer, a science communicator, as well as a social justice advocate for the sciences. Her research focuses on extragalactic X-ray binaries and using multi-wavelength data, specifically answering how these high energy binaries form, grow and influence their surroundings. She obtained her PhD in 2013 at the University of Southampton in the UK and has since been awarded the Fulbright Scholarship and actually arrived to the Netherlands after holding the Royal Society Newton International Fellowship at Manchester, the Jodrell Bank Centre for Astrophysics that many of you um, know well. And in her role as Equity and Inclusion Officer, Tana will be working with stakeholders across the astronomy community in the Netherlands to implement evidence-based interventions and to create meaningful and sustainable change. In addition to her work um, within this role, Tana will be continuing her own research and is currently co-leading a large international team on identifying and characterizing X-ray binaries in the Mag Magellanic clouds taken with the SKA precursors as Kappa Meerkat. Um, without further ado, ado, I really want to stress, and I really speak on behalf of the entire com community to say really a huge welcome and thank you to Tana for taking on this very challenging role, um, as well as really her leadership and um, her, you know, the, the, her vision shaping, I think we will see in the next couple of years, on how we can really build a fully inclusive and equitable community, astronomy community in the Netherlands. And so really a big thank you, Tana, for this and for taking on this role. Um, a few words, sort of housekeeping words. Um, I want to, of course, stress um, that we hope everyone joining and ready to um, make you aware of our code of conduct in the Netherlands astronomy. So please, of course, respect this during this um, webinar, as well as the fact that um, I will be moderating, obviously, and um, Tana will be speaking, I think, for 45 minutes, but there will be ample time for discussion. Um, so please put any questions in the chat and we will be taking questions at the end of her talk, as well as on the YouTube. There is also the possibility to ask questions on the YouTube live stream. So please also do join in for the discussion after Tana's talk. So without further ado, Tana, I pass the floor on to you and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Samaya, for that, um, uh, for that nice introduction hello everyone good afternoon uh wherever you are tuning in from i am currently in amsterdam i'm very excited to be here. i'm very excited to talk to all of you today and hopefully this will be for those who haven't met me yet um a nice introduction to who i am and what i'll be doing um obviously in concert with all of you um to make the dutch astronomical community a safer and more productive and um yeah safer and more productive place for us all uh i want to i'm just gonna kick off and get straight into my talk i just want to quickly also say that this is based on the at least the beginning part of my talk is based on talks i have given in the past so if you have heard me speak before any time in the last sort of 20 months or so um you've seen some parts of this talk but it has been updated and i'm very happy to share all of this with you so let's hit that share screen button and hmm yeah okay that's on and let's hit play from the start and you can all see the slides and we can all hear me so let's go um yeah so welcome to today's uh NIAC seminar and i will be yeah i'll be discussing 
equity, diversity and inclusion in astronomy, specifically in the Netherlands. Also, for those who are following with the captions, I will try and speak more slowly and in a less South African -y accent because I don't know how well the um, captions are going to deal with my accent. So the first thing I want to say when we talk about social justice or equity, diversity and inclusion, I'll be calling it EDI um, throughout the rest of the talk, is that we, if we really want to make this commitment to creating a diverse and inclusive, equita, equitable and um, accessible uh, community, we first have to understand what these concepts mean. So I will be going through what a lot of these buzzwords actually mean. And then the second thing that's very important on a personal level for each and every one of us is to understand that we also have to be prepared to reflect on and have conversations about things that make us uncomfortable. And this is for everyone, no matter how woke you think you are. Um, this is not a time to get defensive. Um, it's about learning and unlearning. And this is, again, for all of us, no matter who we are, we all have aspects of social justice that maybe we're not so great on that we can start to learn about and unlearn our um, behaviors and things like that or our understanding of the world that's maybe not so great. So be prepared to get uncomfortable whether it's with yourself personally or in a group or at work when these things come up that's a natural reaction and growth comes from that um, discomfort. So I'll start really briefly with who I am because the title of the talk is who, what, where, when, why. So I'll try to answer all of these questions. So who am I? My name is Tana Joseph. I'm South African. Uh, I'm an X-ray astronomer and I study uh, extra, extra galactic X-ray binders. I spelled that wrong. That's why I couldn't read it. I also do a lot of science communication. Um, this photo of me here on the night was taken at the uh, last Blue Dot Festival in the north of England that I attended where I uh, got on a st stage, stage and spoke to about 2,000 people. It was super duper fun. I really enjoyed that. And now, of course, I'm the Equity and Inclusion Coordinator for Astronomy in the Netherlands. Very exciting. I know this is a very exciting um, position. And, um, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of writing on this, but the thing that really brought it home to me, I didn't think that it was going to be that exciting, was when my mother sent me a WhatsApp message and said she has received several phone calls of congratulations um, about her daughter's achievement in getting this job. So it's like verified by my mom and other African aunties. So this is a very high profile job. It's very important. And um, we're all going to do, we're all going to be in this together um, to help me achieve so that I can continue to be my mother's favorite child. Also very important about me is that I love bears. Bears are one of the, probably the only apex predator that aren't uh, predators that aren't present in Africa and so I don't get to see them very often except in zoos and for my um, so I've just become very obsessed with bears this is very important if you want to know about who I am as a person and what my you know beliefs and values are it's bears heart bears so I'll be working as part of the NIAC and you hear this word NIAC all the time but just to be, to really clarify um, what does NIAC stand for? It's the Netherlands Astronomy Equity and Inclusion Committee. And this is a one of the committees that make up the Dutch Astronomy Council, the um, RVDA. And NIAC consists of members, um, the, yeah, consists of members from the astronomy organization, so universities and research institutes um, across the country, as well as an observer from the um, Astronomy Council. And the mission of the NIAC is to promote equity and inclusion in the, in the Netherlands astronomy community in the broadest sense. Uh, we are not a judicial committee in any sense. Um, and I will speak at the, at the end of this talk about the kind of things that we want to implement. But that is our main focus, equity and inclusion. And so um, I'm going to very briefly just address something that came up when this talk was advertised, now that we kind of know who I am and who Nayak is, um, several of you may or many of you may have seen the email that went around by a senior academic in our community um, that caused a lot of alarm uh, to, especially to foreign nationals uh, in the community uh, about the way that they were wanting this uh, talk to be carried out. And this person has since apologized, but we also understand that um, intent um, is not 
uh, intent versus impact. So the intent of this person was perhaps not to come across just, um, sounding as they do and make people feel unwelcome and want to exclude people. But we have to acknowledge that the impact was that people did feel excluded, they did feel unwelcome and they did feel unsafe. And I want to say to people who have that experience, your feelings are entirely valid. Um, that is a very reasonable reaction to have to that. I will also go on to say that the person who sent those emails has apologized. They have explained their situation and that the, and since this person works at Appy, at the Anton Panikuk Institute here in Amsterdam, uh, this, this incident um, uh, constitutes a breach of the code of conduct that Maya had also mentioned earlier on the code of conduct of Appy and is being dealt with um, as a breach of the code of conduct incident by the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee of Appy. So this is not, I, I say this in the interest of, of transparency so that people know that this has happened, we have adjusted, we are in um, communication with this person and we are taking this breach seriously and we will keep the community updated um, when we have more, yeah, when we have more information on this, but I also just wanted to take this opportunity to say to people who were negatively impacted that your feelings are valid and we are taking this seriously and uh, further steps in terms of the breach of code of conduct will be taken. So now I've said equity, diversity and inclusion like a lot of times, and um, I think I need to kind of unpack that now. So a lot of people, when they use the word diversity, as some like commonly accepted definitions are having people who look, sound, and are different in your workplace. So they come from different backgrounds or countries, they speak different languages, they have a mixture of abilities, um, socioeconomic backgrounds, um, they, you know, and various personal attributes as well. And inclusion is about not just is about not just having this diversity, but also making uh, people from all walks of life feel valued, supported, welcome, safe, and um, they feel like they have a sense of belonging um, in the workplace, um, as that's the context we're talking about here. So it's not just about getting the nice photo ops to say like, oh, look how diverse our staff is. It's about making sure that everyone has a voice, everyone is heard, and, um, and their needs are met. And that's where we come to the other part of the first um, letter in the acronym, the equity part. Um, it's very interesting as well. I spoke initially about learning and unlearning, and that is not just something I say, but it's something that I see actively happening in the social justice space. And one of the things I noticed really early on was when we started doing EDI, some of you may have noticed this as well. We call it equity, diversity, and inclusion now, but it used to be called equality diversity and inclusion. And some people have uh, started calling it JEDI, so justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. In South Africa, we call it transformation. So there, it has a lot of different names depending on your context. So just to quickly highlight the reason why we've gone from equality to equity is because again, we're learning um, and understanding terms differently and better. Equality, um, yeah, demonstrated in this image in the leftmost panel. So you are looking at three people, three different heights. They're standing behind a wooden fence and then trying to watch a game of soccer. Now, they each, you will notice, they're each standing on a box of the same size and the tallest person can clearly see the soccer match. The second tallest person's head is just above the, the wooden fence and they can see the soccer match standing on the box, but the shortest person still can't see the soccer match because they're not tall enough even by standing on the box and this is the issue with equality equality is the assumption that everyone uh, gets what they need if um if we provide everyone with exactly the same support and this is called equal treatment and but you can see as demonstrated by this image here if you give people three different heights the same size box that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone will be able to see the soccer match which is very important because we all love soccer so then we start using the word equity and the concept of equity where it's that everyone gets the support that they need. Now, as it turns out, the tallest person and these three people still behind this wooden fence trying to watch the soccer, 
the tallest person doesn't even need a box to stand on. They can see perfectly well without the, uh, the need to stand on a box. The second tallest person needs one box to stand on. And now the shortest person has two boxes to stand on. And their heads are all at the same height. They can all watch the soccer now over, the, over this wooden fence. Then there's this concept of restorative justice, where all three people can now see the soccer match because they're no longer standing behind a wooden fence. They're standing behind a chain link fence. And uh, so they don't need these boxes to look over the fence because the fence has now changed fundamentally in nature. It's not a wooden fence anymore. It's a chain link fence. There's some images where there's no fence. So basically justice is when the actual barrier, the actual cause of this problem um, of trying to watch the soccer match has been eradicated and so no one needs this other support anymore we don't need the equality or the equity support anymore because uh the shortest people can just look through the fence and watch the soccer and so hopefully this clarifies the the different words that we'll be using and the different concepts and how they can play out in sort of real world situations so another way to look at at least the diversity and inclusion part um, how we do it in astronomy and academia is that diversity is about recruitment and outreach or science communication and engagement to get more uh, diverse people interested in science and the work that we do. So we're going to schools, uh, we're doing TikToks, et cetera, and we're talking to all sorts of people. Uh, we're doing uh, community science projects like the Zooniverse and all of that to get people um, you know, into science and to see all the exciting, cool research that we do, and maybe they want to join us. In, and then inclusion is kind of more about retention. So it's about using language and resources, um, et cetera, that make the audience or people in our workplace feel engaged, valued, and respected, and like they can actually make a contribution. But as I was going through my career, I started um, out with a lot of science communication. I did a lot of work in, I guess, in the recruitment slash diversity sphere. But after a while, it started to feel like I was luring vulnerable people into dangerous situations. So I decided to focus my work rather on inclusion and retention because I was tired of losing great colleagues uh, to bad circumstances. So one other thing to clarify before we get into the nitty gritty of this, one last thing to clarify here is what is science? And this might sound like a weird thing to include because we're all scientists, or for the most part, we're all scientists, or at the very least work very closely with scientists and are surrounded by them. So why do I bring this up? But the fact of the matter is that a lot of scientists actually don't know what, how to define science. They're doing it, they are a scientist, but how, what actually is this concept of science? And I like this three-prong um, definition uh, given to us by Jonathan Marks, who used to work in the life sciences, I believe, and it was tweeted out by Professor Chanda Prescott-Weinstein who talks about yeah these three aspects so <coughs> science is kind of boils down to the fact that it's three things it's a series of techniques so it's a scientific method or you know this collecting of evidence and data and for a lot of people that's the entire definition of science it's you know it's about collecting facts or you know you're getting evidence and getting information out of it and now we have information and there's information and some of that is facts and some of that is a work in progress but that's what you do just gathering evidence and stacking up the facts um what we also have to consider is that science is a community of people it's about who does the science who gets to do the science um who gets to communicate the science um you know, are we allowed to do certain things and are we not like, you know, maybe the ethical considerations, all that kind of stuff that comes about when you have people collecting these facts. Then number three is also an information organization structure in conversation with power. So the hierarchies and the resources and again, who has access to them, who dictates what science we do, et cetera. Um, a lot of people outside of science uh, assume that we just get to, you get an idea in your head and you just, you know, get money and you you do whatever you want. But we obviously we know that um, as scientists, you follow the money, what's hot right now, what the government prioritizes, et cetera. And if you take all of these things together, I actually add a fourth part um, to this, that science is and always has been political. Now, a lot of 
um, non-scientists don't like to hear that. A lot of scientists don't like to hear that. But for me, it is very self-evident when you have a hierarchy, when you have power plays, when you have people. Um, as I say, the personal is political. Uh, these all point to the fact that science is political. It can be politicized. I mean, we're in the midst right now of a global pandemic uh, with scientists doing a lot of heroic, amazing work and getting punished for it as a South African. Um, as a South African scientist, I've seen what um, some of my friends have gone through when we, uh, or people working in virology and they announced like, you know, we've, we did the hard work and we identified a new variant and then South Africans get punished. So it becomes political very quickly and very easily and sometimes very obviously. And the, uh, the next thing I want to address is the whole concept of how academia is set up. So now we kind of have an idea of what EDI is, what social justice is, what science is. And of course, feel free to argue with me about this. We will be chatting um, at the end of this talk and uh, throughout my time as uh, in this role. Um, if you have other ideas, I'd love to hear them about the definitions of science. But something that stuck me in my uh, postdoc position at Manchester, um, it finally clicked into place why, at least for me, why academia is the way it is, that there are all these unspoken rules and things are done in this interesting way where you, you know, like, uh, just if you if you haven't been in it for your whole life or you don't come from a background, you know, where you have a parent who's an academic, it can be very bewildering and very strange why we do the things we do and why things are, you know, what, what causes the status quo. And it comes down to the fact for me that academia is still largely based on 17th century European social structures. So this Western scientific revolution that started in Europe in the 17th century, so in the 1600s, with people like Kepler, Galileo, Newton, etc. And that kind of dictated how we do, how science is done in the West and it's expanded to the rest of the world as well. If you look at the history of this, these people, these men um, are rich, they come from in general influential families, like, you know, they got sponsored by the kings of their country to do this research. Um, so they were at leisure to study. There was a very annoying meme that happened at the um, on social media, at least on Twitter, at the start of the pandemic when we were all in lockdown, where people, a lot of scientists, were passing around this meme saying, you know, Isaac Newton invented calculus when he was in lockdown during the plague. So what are you gonna do during, you know, during lockdown? Um, you know, what are you gonna, you know, is it are you gonna write Principia? Like, what's the thing that you're gonna do as a scientist? And that implies heavily that, of course, that you are at leisure to study, that you don't have any other responsibilities and you can just chill and invent calculus and stick needles in your eye. Um, Newton definitely did that, go look it up. I'm not inventing that fact about him. Um, he was an interesting character. So today's academic system basically is still set up for people who don't have to worry about money, don't have to what about family responsibilities, et cetera. And this affects how we think about science and science communication, how, you know, these attitudes going into when we do science communication and engagement and talking to the wider public. If we're not careful, these things can really color how we talk to people outside of our um, research community. And an expansion of this is that academia then ultimately disadvantages all sorts of other people with, um, with uh, other things going on in their life. Uh, so if, like I said, family or caring responsibilities, if you are religious, um, this is a, a Western thing or a global North thing. We don't have this tension necessarily in Africa between religion and science. But yeah, if you are disabled, if you have various reasons for not participating in drinking and socializing, a lot of our networking is done over drinks and that can, you know, that can affect a whole swathe of people who don't feel comfortable doing that. And also uh, when we talk about socioeconomic consideration, science academia is seen as a luxury for those who come from socioeconomically disadvantaged um, backgrounds or underserved communities. Um, and this was something that I had a big blind spot to coming from a firmly middle-class background in South Africa with parents who are both university graduates. Um, it was very normalized in my family for me to go and study for 10 years and become a doctor of physics. Um, and I didn't quite appreciate the barriers that 
this throws up for other people. So the issue of, um, I've even been told in my time and maybe others have similar considerations that it's, it's not the done thing to ask about money when you talk about science. You're supposed to do science and be a researcher because you love it and it's incredible, but um, that doesn't pay, I can't pay rent in prestige. I don't know about the rest of you, but I haven't figured out how to get a landlord to accept love of science um, in, in lieu of money. So it's not really you know, grounded in reality. And other thing that we also need to get at from the start is that the system isn't broken. It was built this way. The oppressive structures that exist in wider society are also at play in academia and again carry through to our science communication when we talk to, uh, to wider society. So we need to understand this. And the reason I put this in was um, a few years ago when there was, you know, there started to be this very big push for getting women in science and, and, and um, you know, gender equality and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was this thing, you know, this big push to mentor women and how to the, tell us how to succeed in, in academia and the things that we have to change about ourselves to be successful. And we, and we called it the leaky pipeline and all of that, but this is all just, these are all the wrong ways to go about it because the system is, uh, it, the system is built to exclude certain kinds of people and uh, women definitely fall under that category, for instance. So the idea that we need to understand is that the women, we started pushing back and saying, women aren't broken, we don't need to be fixed. The system is not broken, it's not a broken system, it's a system that has been working for centuries, but the system is flawed. And once you make that change of mindset um, around how academia functions, it's much more empowering um, and it is much more accurate and then we can start to actually, um, you know, walk on this path of change. So now at this point, a lot of you might be saying, well, you know, um, as this, uh, in this graphic here on the bottom uh, left, is that my left? Yeah, left, a teacher is imploringly saying to a student, this is a still taken by the way from a fantastic TV show called Bob's Burgers. Um, you should check it out, it's very sweet. The teacher is saying to the, the student, we don't have time to create a safe environment, which like, you know, some of you might be saying, I just want to do science. I just want to get nail that Nobel Prize and I don't have time to be touchy feely and, and all this kind of stuff. And other people might be saying, well, none of this is, you know, I've never heard of anything um, bad happening. Nothing bad has ever happened to me. And um, I'm, you know, the system works perfectly fine for me. My career is going swimmingly. And that kind of is this, um, snake here in the yellow background saying nothing is real until it hurts me and a lot of people have this feeling that things are or not aware of how um, challenging the, this academic system this academic status quo can be to people who don't fit a very narrow specific mold of what a scientist is so either yeah you can you know dismiss it and say it's not real because nothing bad ever happened to me or you can say listen yeah I know this is problems but um, I only have one shot at this Nobel Prize so what are we doing here Let's just keep it moving with the science. So this is all kind of just to say that science academia is full of bad actors and bad behavior. A Royal Astronomical Society survey that was the data which was released last year, so it was data gathered um, in 2020, about 2019, showed that of the 650 respondents, 44% of them, of our colleagues. So this was a survey not just done in the UK, it was open to people working in astronomy and geophysics all across the world. 44% um, said that they had suffered from bullying and harassment in the workplace in the preceding 12 months. So this is, is pre-COVID times now. And that this kind of bad behavior, this bullying and harassment uh, disproportionately affects disabled people, women, non-binary people, and the LGBTQ plus community and people of color. So um, if things aren't happening to you or you don't see bad behavior, ask yourself, are you in one of, are you the, uh, in the demographic that might be uh, more affected? If you're not in any of these demographics, then maybe it's a, then you know your data is faulty. There's some kind of selection bias. These things aren't happening to you or happening to people like you maybe at a lesser rate. And so it's not, so it's actually possibly a bigger problem than you realize. So these are just some of the numbers here. Um, I usually have other examples, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, showcase some of the other examples of bad actors and bad behavior, but the statistics are here to um, 
kind of peruse and I'll put the link to this report. Uh, there's a link to this report at the end of this talk as well, and you can circulate the slides. So I've now given you a lot of definitions. Um, I have given you um, some statistics. I have unpacked what I think science is and, you know, given some context of how these things kind of hang together. So science is about the people who do the science as well. And when you have the people, it's political. And when you have politics, um, social justice enters into that as well, because politics is, of course, not as free and fair um, as we would like to think in a healthy democracy. So how do we change things? How do we go forward? What, uh, you know, what, what can we do? So here's some points to consider and some ways forward. So something to consider is here's that first bit of uncomfortability maybe for you. I want you to ask yourself personally to yourself and going forward, if you are engaging in EDI work or in social justice work in the science context, why are you doing it? Are you doing it as a box ticking exercise or a way to get funding or an award? Because there's now increasing amounts of funding available and awards uh, for this kind of thing. And are you doing it to tick boxes from HR or from you know, some kind of government mandate? Or do you actually really care about making science academia a place where people from all walks of life and all kinds of backgrounds and all kinds of personal attributes can have access to science, contribute to science and thrive in science if they so choose? And this illustration here on the right hand side is a still taken from a movie that's possibly still on Netflix, it's called Enola Holmes, so Sherlock Holmes's younger sister. And this woman here is challenging, she's addressing Sherlock Holmes and she's challenging him because he's just said, oh, I don't care about politics. Um, and Sherlock is, of course, a moneyed person, Victorian England. So he doesn't, you know, a lot of things just pass him by because he's chill. He just has his money and does whatever he wants. And then this woman challenges him and says, politics or in our case, social justice doesn't interest you because you have no interest in changing a world that suits you so well. And for a lot of social justice work that we do, this is very much the case. Um, why, for a lot of people, especially those who have been successful in academia, um, will say to themselves, oh, why would I want to change a system that is working perfectly for me and the people I like? Why would I, you know, things are going gangbusters here in my career and I don't want anything to change. And I, um, and that might cause some people to be very passive. It might cause some people to engage with EDI on a very surface level, or it might even cause some people to actively work against um, equity, diversity, and inclusion measures. And we need to be aware of this. So ask yourself this question and be honest and challenge yourself. Why are you doing this? And, you know, depending on what conclusion you come to, how can you change that or how can you be better? So some more things to consider. Uh, academics from underrepresented groups are asked to do much more labor for social justice or EDI than others. And this is called uh, cultural taxation and possibly also tokenism. And so something I've started, I've always advocated when I, uh, when I started giving these kinds of talks uh, two, about two years ago, and something that I've started speaking to individual Dutch EDI committee, astronomy EDI committees is, we need to start thinking about how we're going to compensate for and acknowledge this labor. Um, everyone at the moment is, except me, um, as far as I know is doing EDI uh, without being paid, you're doing it in a voluntary position, but it's important work. So how do we acknowledge that? How do you get to put this on your CV, count it towards service? Is it taken into consideration when it comes to promotions or prizes and things like that. I'm finally now doing this, uh, doing equity and inclusion and diversity work in a role where I specifically get paid to do that, but the vast majority of people are not in that situation. And that is, um, it is unfair and it's unethical and we need to think about changing that. So something else that's also very important to consider, which when you think about it, it is a weird thing that I have to explicitly say to a bunch of scientists, especially um, to physical sciences, to astrophysicists, because we think that we're, you know, the ultimate um, data robots and we're super unbiased and, um, you know, like we're like super hardcore rock stars of science where everything is just super evidence-based. But when it comes to EDI or even sometimes PSYCOM, we do a bunch of feel-good stuff. We do stuff that's good for optics. 
And instead, what we need to do is start to engage in evidence-based actions and interventions um, and policies that will ensure that the field of astronomy is actually inclusive and does cultivate a sense of belonging for everyone who chooses to become a part of this community. And we mustn't just do stuff that makes us feel or look good. So another example is, again, I'll use the, the, the gender equality um, as an example. First of all, get, just trying to get women and girls into STEM is not going to fix gender equality because there aren't just two genders. We need to be more open to, um, you know, uh, to changing that kind of binary understanding of gender. And when we do our interventions, when we make our efforts, uh, when we implement our policies, we need to think, rethink about, you know, how we do gender stuff. But also, uh, we do a lot of women in science. In fact, the other day was just the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And we do a lot of mentoring for, for women and, and all this kind of lean in stuff. But at the end of the day, we're only moving the needle, tiny, tiny increments, a lot of effort and time and high profile stuff is going into this work to get more girls and women interested in science, but um, the system is still chewing them up and spitting them out. So clearly what we're doing isn't working and we need to start to rethink how we address, um, address these, these um, uh, imbalances in the work that we do. And we need to start looking at like, what does the data actually say? For instance, the data says that unconscious bias training does, there's no evidence to support that it works. And in fact, there's some findings that show that depending on what kind of unconscious bias training you go for, it might actually make you aware of other biases and start acting on those biases, which is terrible. Something that is more um, grounded in evidence that actually is shown to work much better is something like bystander intervention training, where you teach people what bullying or harassment or uh, to support someone and step in if they see this bad behavior taking place and then how you know how to um and then also where to go to get support to, or to report incidences so more practical things like that where you can actually measure uh measure things more more accurately and more clearly action items and then also the last thing i like to tell people is to especially for higher ups if you are at the levers of power this is something that you need to consider. Start thinking of EDI the way we think of health and safety. So instead of thinking of it as a separate thing that happens, um, it's in the community, but it's a separate thing or a separate session at your conference or whatever, think of it as health and safety. Think of it as an integral part of workplace culture and processes and policies without which we cannot properly conduct our business and research. Because if you contravene health and safety laws, they, that someone gets hurt, there are repercussions. And we need to start thinking about EDI and implementing it in the same kind of way, because ultimately EDI is about the health and safety of, um, of employees or people in our community, because we can't be expected to do world-class, world-changing science if we're expending a lot of time and energy fighting off bad behavior or trying to change things all the time, um, and you're under the stewardess. So some ways forward um, taken from the report on harassment at the University of Groningen uh, that I quite like, it was also referenced in the follow-up article um, that came out recently in the Times Higher Education. Um, three things is the, they suggest an implementation of zero tolerance policies and effective complaints procedures. And this would include things like reworking funding structures, and procedures and hiring practices so that uh, we make it clear from the start what the rules are. Um, and if you contravene these rules, what the outcomes of that would be. Um, there are There's at least one massive funding body in the US, the NIH, um, that has you know, started reviewing the PIs that receive funding from them. And if they are found in contravention of code of conduct or of other um, or you know, engaging in other bad behavior, they can get their money taken away. And so we need to start thinking about how we fund um, the research and how to do the funding in such a way that if someone with a lot of funding is found to be doing something bad, that that doesn't have a negative impact on our ability to do research and also more importantly, a negative impact on those who have been victimized. 
So that would possibly then mean bringing us to point two that we start to work with external monitors of workplace safety. For example, funding bodies auditing how their money is being used for EDI, if it's actually you know, effective, like what's the return on the investment that they're going to get. And then thirdly, we need to make awareness and EDI training mandatory in some cases. For example, this bystander intervention training. Again, kind of thinking about like, uh, like health and safety, where when you start at a new workplace, there's some kind of induction, maybe it's an online course you have to do or a lecture you have to sit in, where they explain to you who the fire marshal is, what to do if something catches fire, um, what to do if you know the building gets attacked by birds or there's a tornado warning or whatever the case may be. So these were, and I agree with all of uh, this work, and I've also been in um, contact with the, uh, the people who wrote this article and put this report together, who made these um, suggestions. Um, a, one of them is a Dutch academic, and we will be working together going forward to try and start to see how we can implement some of these. So, the, so lastly, I want to quickly cover, um, not in a lot of depth, um, that will come later, our plans and priorities that I've sat down with some of the members of the NIAC committee to, um, to kind of give you an idea of the kind of uh, policies and things that we want to see done and see implemented. So, uh, first of all, the policies, um, we want to have more transparency and openness in funding and hiring processes, as I mentioned, and promotion processes. We want to start thinking about fairly compensating and acknowledging voluntary EDI work done by our community members. And also um, something that make that is very tricky, it's not going to be straightforward and easy to do, but how do we deal with issues that arise from people, organizations outside of the Netherlands that have negative of our economy community because it's very difficult for instance for someone from one institution so you travel and visit somewhere something happens to you then a lot of people fall into this kind of gray area where it didn't happen at your institution so the institution might say well it didn't happen here and it wasn't someone from here who did this so we can't really help you and the other institution might say well you aren't an employee here you're not part of our community so our rules and regulations don't cover you um, so these are the kind of complex things that we need to sort out, but it's very pressing and important because, of course, uh, astronomy is increasingly globalized and increasingly multinational and um, also increasingly starting to involve um, the private sector. So how do we make sure that um, people don't fall through the cracks and inc incidents are addressed no matter who they happen to or where they um, happen to take place? And then the activity side, um, Apart from things that are already ongoing, training sessions, uh, these seminars and other diversity seminars that are happening across the country in the astronomy space, um, we would like to implement a community survey similar to the one I spoke about through the RA, uh, that the RAS did, um, just so that we can start to get a handle on the specific issues that are affecting the Dutch astronomy community because the RAS one is a great start. That's always a great start, but it's a more kind of global look. Anyone from anywhere in the world who's in astronomy or geophysics could reply. But we, of course, need to get to the heart of uh, what's happening in the Netherlands, because this is where we are, and this is what the committee is for. This is what I've been hired to do, so that we structure our interventions in a way that addresses things that are relevant to us here um, in the Netherlands. And then further, a lot of workshops to all levels of uh, the Dutch astronomy community, and then something else that uh, might sound trivial, but I think is very important, um, and discussing this with linguists and other people, this language awareness um, to create a create awareness of the language that we use. So, so maybe some style guides and a glossary of these terms, because I know I've thrown a lot of things at you. And why this is important is that the language that we use influences how we see the world, how we understand the world, and how we understand ourselves and our place in the world. There's um, studies that are done that um, on people who are bilingual, for instance, or um, you know how you move through the world depending on what language you think in. And so a small but important step is for us to kind of yeah, start to think about the wording that we use and the um, 
naming conventions that we use that maybe are but out of date and all these kind of things to start moving towards a way of speaking and thinking um, and understanding that is more inclusive and accessible for everyone. So I think I am done talking at you now. And now we're going to talk to and with each other. I just want to show you that this, these references, so think a lot of the things I've talked about and some other things I haven't, that you can go and do some further reading. And then there's also a further reading um, section as well for those who are, you know, champing at the book to start, how can I be better? Or, or just want to kind of um, get a feel for what other people are saying, because I'm a lot of what I'm telling you is from my experience as well, but it's important to, of course, we know, go and read our references so we get a more complete picture of what's going on. So that is the end of my talk, and I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I see there's a lot of stuff in the chat. There there's is a lot, a lot of stuff. Time, so, and hopefully on YouTube as well. So um, we have some time, yeah, to get into it. Thank you. Yes. And of course, everyone, this is an open discussion where we, of course, respecting our code of conduct, but everyone is um, welcome to share their thoughts. I think there are two active threads going on at the, on the chat. Thank you firstly, Tana, for your excellent talk and I think really outlining some of the issues in terms of language as well as um, defining things and how, we, how you are seeing, I guess, the vision of going forward. And I guess many people here will have many questions to follow up on this, but um, there are two active threads I see on the Zoom. And then I think Jake will be allowing us or, um, informing us what's going on on the YouTube live stream. Um, the first one I think which is shortest is probably Yako Vink and Antonia Rollinson who've been discussing about Kepler. Yako, are you there still? Or oh, Antonia? Uh, yeah, I'm here. But it, as you said, it was kind of a simple, very short discussion. Okay, Yako, would you like to bring up your point? I see you're there, but maybe um, let me scroll up. So I will read it out. Yako's point was, um, hmm. apologies, because I'm just, there's a lot of discussions. Yes, as a note, Kepler was actually poor and he had to flee his hometown with his mom as she was accused to be a witch and then Antonia, I think, has stressed that Tana had referred to this, most of these men, but I will mention that. Tana, if you want to follow up there. Um, yeah, um, so there's one example, and that's great, but like, as I said, most of them, if you read up, they have patron, they, you know, they were um, given patronage, am I saying this word right? Patronages by yeah. kings or by fancy people, or they had a rich relative, um, and, you know, that's the case all over the world. Um, I think it was, was it Carl Sagan or was it Noam Chomsky who said, I'm less interested in the folds of Einstein's brain because they was like, you know, they did a lot of stuff after Einstein died. They cut his brain out and they wanted to examine it as, as, if, as if we knew enough about the brain back then or even now to be able to discern where, you know, his genius lies. And they said, I'm less interested in the folds of Einstein's brain as I am, um, than I am more worried about, you know, wonder about, um, how many equal geniuses toiled in fields and, and labored and never got anywhere near, you know, being having the opportunity to do um, I'll just, this kind of I work. would just add to that in the UK that, you know, Turing has now his five pound note. Yeah. It was killed by the British government. Yeah, he was killed by the, for, for being gay. <laughs> so like, gay. you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. Now you're going to Good coin. Yeah, so there's a lot of unrecognized genius in this world and possibly even among the people who were pushed out of academia for bullying or other horrible things that um, our colleagues do to each other from time to time and far too frequently. And I firmly believe there's someone that's been pushed out of academia who could have, you know, we could have known aliens by now, but some, you know, someone said something horrible to a postdoc and they left quite rightly, it's their own life. And now we don't know about aliens and I'm sad. And I don't want that to keep happening. What other amazing things are we missing out on because of 
bad behavior. I have the question from YouTube. Is there a good gender equality plan that you would suggest or share? Um, like I said already, the first thing to do with this gender equality plan is to expand the concept of what gender is um, and not just make it so bindy. This focus on the girl child and focus on uh, women and girls only. So that's the first step. And then we take it from there and we, someone had a quote, it was specifically about black women, but it applies here across the board to um, gender minorities and women as well. Mm -hmm. uh, that says uh, black women are over mentored and under championed. So that's something to, mm -hmm. to shift as well. The mindset of how many mentors do you need? How many of us even got trained to be mentors and now we're in mentorship positions. Um, and we actually need to just start doing things, start nominating people for things. Um, and instead of just like, you know, giving advice, do something actionable. My, for instance, my PhD supervisor is still sending me recommendations and still telling me to apply for things. And I am nine years post PhD. So he's a great example of fantastic mentor, incredibly supportive um, and still cares about his students many years later. Um, even though most of his efforts seem to be trying to get me amazing jobs in the US, because uh, <laughs> he's in the US and he wants me, um, he wants us all to be there so he can help us more. Um, so yeah, there's, um, that also kind of brings up something that I think is very important to acknowledge in academia. I've, perhaps the, the Netherlands is better than at this than other places, but um, just to mention that something in academia that doesn't happen if I say in the private sector is that we are expected to do a lot of work that we are not specifically trained for. And I think that also leads to a lot of confusion and can lead to a lot of harm when we have to take up roles. I have a PhD in counting X-ray photons, but uh, I, you know, I'm expected to be able to lecture, to mentor, to run a budget, to be a project manager. Um, not all universities give you um, courses on how to be a lecturer. Not all universities or institutions give you training on how to be a mentor, how to be a supervisor, uh, you know, all these kind of things. We're just expected to know this by osmosis and that leads to a lot of confusion and perhaps yeah. a very, a not very uniform experience for a lot of people where it can range from incredible to terrible. And so that's something that we also need to address in academia. Sorry for going a bit off topic there. I didn't know. No, but I, I, I think, think that's why important. our committee and you have that on board. And I think I just gave a talk for us master's students like a week ago that exactly says that the Netherlands astronomy doing this is actually much more positive in the world than anything else about what's happening. And I know we have ex-students like Katja, who's here. She can ask a question in a minute. But... Now, Netherlands astronomy is probably the best in the world about this. And Tana, you have to make it the best, best but no pressure. It's but it's better than anything else I've ever seen. Um, I see that, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm going to um, move on. I know yep. Ralph, Ralph Wise has his hand up. Ralph, is this in response to the previous thing or is it the thread that's going on in the chat? No, it's in response to the current discussion. Okay, so please go ahead. I, I would say related to this issue of having to do work that we are not trained for, um, I would make a counterpoint to that. I would say we are expected to have, to have the wisdom to know when we need some training for something. That's different from saying, well, you're expected to do all these things without being trained for it. Right. So, I mean, that we, we, we are fairly uh, we are fairly smart and resourceful people. And so we should know when we can do something without training and when not. Or we should at least, shall we say, so we should have a certain amount of self-reflection and be sensitive to input from our colleagues of, yes, Ralph, you think you can read that budget, but actually no. And, and so maybe you should learn a bit more about that. I think that is somewhat different from saying we're expected to simply do all these things without training. Thank you for that point. Um, I would say that that is also perhaps uh, that lack of introspection is something that needs to be addressed as well, because a lot of people don't have that. A lot of people are not open to 
you know, to, because it could be the case that there are, you know, support, there is support in place where you can go and learn these things where people just think, well, I'm, ex- I'm great. I don't need any of that. So the way to get around that is to kind of make people make it known that, you know, if you want to do certain kinds of jobs, you have to do certain kinds of training. It's only, it seems common sense. And, but it also seems common sense that you would know if you don't know something, but you might not know that you don't know something until it's too late and you're in the thick of it. And it's, you know, six weeks into the semester and your money's all spent because uh, you don't know how to budget properly. No, that's true. Self-reflection is, is definitely something that, that many of us, including myself, could do with some more of. Thank and I encourage you. that. Thank you. Okay, and then I th- see there's a very active chat going on um, about the statement Tana made about science is political, and I guess Ralph wanted some clarification, and there's a lot of other active discussion from Rui Azvedo, Scott Traeger. Um, there's not, sorry, another question has come up, but um, many people have contributed Antonia Rawlinson to this discussion. Uh, maybe I can ask Ralph, maybe you, you would like to pose the question to Tana? Yeah, the discussion was about the issue of science being political. And I think the chat is mostly about, um, I mean, I objected to the statement initially, and it depends a lot about what you mean when you say science whether you mean the, bo- the body of knowledge that science has created or whether you mean the scientific community and the way in which it rewards different people for their efforts and so on and so forth. So science, whether or not that statement is true and how important the political aspect of it is may, de- may depend a lot on what exactly you mean by yeah. science. So this is a lot to unpack and I encourage people to read the thread and uh, put their thoughts in there as well. But after this, um, yeah, and this is an ongoing discussion. And I would say that it is the fact that it's political and this has already been pointed out in the thread from what I've quickly scanned through. It's things like the science that we get to do. We don't just get to do any science. It's political. The government decides. The politicians decide who gets money to do what. So that's political. What we do, what science we do, is not left up to us. So there's already a massive impact on uh, from the political side there. Um, then there's also, you know, this thing about again, this thing about what is science? Are we talking about that collection of facts? Is that true? Um, is that political? Uh, the people who do the science obviously have political motivations, and that can lead you astray. Um, and, you know, you can be influenced by money um, to do or say certain things as a scientist that aren't ethical or um, won't stand up to scrutiny, um, and that could have political motivations. So the people are political, and that definitely impacts the kind of the kind of work you do or how you do your work, how you think of the world, which, again, is also mentioned in, um, uh, in this chat. And so there's a lot of nuance to this. And this whole thing about the one truth, this one objective truth is also something that we as scientists need to think about more, maybe um, talk to some social scientists about this, uh, because there's, you know, this alleged black and white world that we live in where something is true or not true. But then like, what of quantum mechanics? We know the quantum world is always telling us, ha, 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 ha. But what if I'm not like that, though? <laughs> what if I have a bit of spinangular momentum and you don't know where I'm going to go? So, like, even in our hardcore science at its most, like, leading-edge hardcore stuff, like, do we know where that electron is going to turn up? Um, where the spin's going to put it? There's a lot of blurriness, a lot of, um, a lot of yeah, non-binary aspects of the universe that we need to consider as scientists, but also um, when we consider how we do our work, what's motivating us, who's allowed to do the work, who gets the funding, where it happens is also very political. Let's not forget, I'm a South African. I know that um, the SK was put in South Africa for political reasons, because it looked good, because it looked, it looked fantastic on paper. Of course, you want to give the SKA to South Africa. Everyone loves to help Africa. It looks amazing. Australia had the knowledge. South Africa had never built a radio interferometer um, until a few years before Meerkat was built, but they gave it to us because it looked good, because of politics, and because we put together the best, um, you know, the best package to say, la, 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 let's sing and dance for you, this is what we're going to do. We pulled it off, make no mistake, crushing it, Meerkat was that, 
But that was a political decision. We had no business being in the running there. No business. There's a lot of political decisions about a lot of telescopes around work. Yeah. And also, I mean, again, Ralph, coming Ralph kind go. of, yeah, <laughs> kind of coming around to the decolonization aspect, why are some, why the telescopes where they are, that is not, you know, that is not um, a source of something that's very common. There's a lot of tension in Hawaii. There's a lot of, ten- the, in some circles, a lot of tension about the, JWST and the naming of it. There's a lot of politics, a lot of feelings. And I think that we can't disentangle the science from that. Thank you, Tana. Um, I saw Rui Asbedo had their hand up. Do you want um, to say no, anything? No, uh, Tana uh, actually said everything I wanted to say. So thank you. <laughs> okay. And then um, Ralph, would you like to respond? Or perhaps, uh, given the discussion, I, I think there are several other questions we can also I think, pick up uh, offline. I think this is an interesting discussion that I would certainly like to have more, but I think we should also deal with some other topics. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Okay, so I'll move to Daniela Huppenkorten. I hope oh, I pronounced uh, it correctly. Yeah, okay, Daniela. thank you. I think that's just a quick response. I just wanted to mention that this conversation echoes what I have been following a lot in the machine learning and data science community about um, political science. And I think if you look at, for example, the FACT conference, the fairness and accountability um, in in a machine learning conference, there's sort of at least some growing understanding that all of the decisions we make in this process of doing science, they are informed by our history and our preconceptions. And in astronomy, we sort of, uh, to some extent, you know, the subjects that we study at least are sort of stars and black holes and the universe, um, and they're very removed from our daily lives. But there's this growing understanding, I think, in other fields that the process of doing science, the process of deriving, every part of that does is informed by personal and political um, backgrounds and understandings. And so even that corpus of facts, I don't think is apolitical because it also, um, you have to ask which facts are not part of that corpus? Why are they not part of this corpus? What are the things that never got to research? What effect does that have in, for example, the medical field when, you know, certain, certain groups have never been studied or something like that? So I don't think that this corpus of facts can really be seen as apolitical. You can also ask, for example, I think about this every time I have to quote Fisher in a paper, when I have to quote Fisher, who was, you know, a a very, who was a eugenicist, but also one of the founders of statistics. What does that mean if I have, you know, to cite his papers? What kind of atrocities are these results based on? And so there's a lot there, I think, that, you know, is, can be discussed, but I also think there is a larger conversations about this going on and a lot of good scholarship, especially in machine learning and statistics at the moment. Tana, would, would you like to respond or? Oh no, that was fantastic. Thank you, Daniela. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a ongoing conversation and um, and something that, yeah, that we should keep discussing and yeah, and it's not going to be comfortable and it's going to be tricky, but um, hopefully, yeah, hopefully this now we've kickstarted that, as we say on, on Twitter, that discourse, or as they say in social sciences, the discourse. And um, yeah, hopefully it'll continue and we can, because I think as scientists, it's also important to engage with that kind of philosophy or science way of thinking as well to, you know, to keep us honest and to um, help us understand our place in the world. Because our, our understanding or, or the way that we do science right now is one way of understanding the world and uh, one way of understanding the universe. It is not the only way. And I think that's very really important also to keep in mind. Thank you, Daniela. I'm going to go on to our next question from Olga Bayadina. Olga, are you there? Or else I can repeat it, say it out loud. Um, Okay, I will say it out loud. Um, So the Netherlands is one of the lowest percentages of female researchers. Why do you think this is so? And what can be done about it? 
So yeah, that is a, it's a very good question. We kind of started to touch on that already. Um, I think that well, part of this is, of course, people being, uh, let's, okay, let's stick to, I guess, women um, in this particular case, but this also um, applies to uh, non-binary people as well, people of other gender identities, um, even more so than for uh, cisgender women, that as the as the statistics show, and not just that RAS statistics that I showed uh, from that study, but uh, lots, there's a growing body of evidence, lots of data to show that women are, of course, disproportionately affected by these bad actors and this bad behavior. So the people are being pushed out simply um, and then, I mean, in the Netherlands, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of parental leave and all that kind of stuff and work-life balance. People really strive for that, but clearly that's not doing the job on its own to keep more female researchers in academia. So we're going to have to get into some uncomfortable things that we don't want to talk about. Like maybe maybe the Netherlands has a higher incidence of, of uh, gender-based harassment, and we might uncover that in our you know, in our um, survey that we conduct about the, you know, about the astronomy community in this country. I'm not saying that is the case, but that could be something. And that sounds horrible to say. Why would I single out this country in particular, especially when its laws are so, um, you know, world renowned for being so liberal and the people here pride themselves on being so liberal. But is that actually the case? Um, South Africa, for instance, has a very, very liberal um, constitution. It's actually studied it out the world as one of the model constitutions it's so great but we have some of the most horrific rates of gender-based violence in the world so just because something is great on paper doesn't mean that it's actually so in real meat space so that's something that we're going to have to explore um and start doing your exit interviews that that's something that um, i worked in a very dysfunctional department once where after a bunch of international postdocs who were leaving and had found good jobs off it was about six out in the exit interviews all the things that were wrong with the department they stopped doing exit interviews at that department after that and they haven't they continued it it's been almost 10 years so we need to not do that we need to not be scared to get into uncomfortable truths and uncover mucky things um so that we can move forward uh, so I don't have a short answer for that, but yeah, we are going to try and use, try and get the data, try and get the evidence and figure out what this problem is and um, hopefully, yeah, try and rectify the solution again for all previously or historically ex uh, excluded uh, genders. That's a nice way of saying it. Yeah, historically excluded genders, because that includes um, a lot more, a lot more people. It's more holistic to say it like that. Thank you, Tana. I see there's a comment from comment from Tanmoy Lasker about the previous point about self awareness. Um, Tanmoy, would you like to say it, or I can also mention it? Um, Tanmoy is making the point that there are no universal standards for any of these things in terms of self awareness, budgeting, supervising, mentoring, and saying it's actually pr pretty difficult to know when we are doing well except by tracking results. And as Tana says, by then it's often too late or at the very least inefficient and at worst potentially harmful for people who are directly or indirectly impacted. Um, thank you. Okay, and then Ilsa, I think, has the next question on chat as well as her hand up. Yeah, this was actually following up on, on the discussion we just had about women in, in astronomy. And, and I wanted to add maybe a few points from, from my experience, but also some, some work that I've done in the past. There, there are studies that show that the more liberal your, your laws are, the more options you have for parental leave and such. This usually benefits men much more than women. Um, so it would be interesting to see if, if that would be the case also in the Netherlands. And that, that besides, I also think in the Netherlands, because in the 1970s already, 1980s, we started to have opportunities for part-time work, which were at that time really geared towards getting more women into the, the labor force. Um, that was quite unique at the time within Europe. And, and my impression is that always we've, we've, we've got stuck in that system somehow, and we did not move along when other countries moved further forward in, in, in gender equality in that sense. 
And I would be interesting to maybe at some point have a sociologist look at this in, in, a, in a little bit more detail. I've had long discussions, uh, I forgot his name, but there's this guy in Sweden who does uh, lots of studies about uh, gender equity and as well, he, he gave a talk here for the Dutch astronomy community a few years ago. So it's, it's, it's definitely not just, just astronomy where we see this in the Netherlands, it's, it's broad, it's, it's uh, society wide. And I, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, that actually many of the Dutch people themselves don't see the problem as serious as it is. And many younger women are raised with the idea that there's no problem anymore. We've solved this in the 1980s with our new laws and therefore the problem doesn't exist. Whereas actually when you get a bit further ahead in your career, you realize it definitely does still exist. Thank you, Elsa. Tana, would you like to respond or? Um, yeah, I mean, thanks, Elsa, for your, for your insight there. And I think the thing that you said, like, that the India is very, very important. This, uh, there might also be people who are thinking, like, you know, why are we spending time on this EDI stuff? We solve this gender problem, like racism. I, You know, there's some people that say, for instance, um, in Europe, they're like, oh, racism is an American problem. Like, why are you trying to bring these problems here? Or uh, we solved sexism um, as if the wage gap doesn't exist. Um, or, you know, like, you know, we don't have, it's not the olden days. And why are you talking about colonialism and all this kind of stuff? And I think that that is something that, um, depending on who you are, depending on, uh, you know, how much skin you have in this game, um, it can come as a horrific shock to you to come to a university where you think everyone's like, you know, their minds are so open and to be faced with, I mean, any kind of bad behaviors, harassment, bullying, anything like that sabotage or whatever the case may be retaliation will come as a shock to anyone but when you pair that with the fact that you thought you were in a space that was safe and was better than that or beyond that or above that um that double where we can really you know um can really knock you off your feet um and also yeah just getting you know there might just be people who just don't want to acknowledge that these are issues at all and then there's also the case of people who are neutral in this what we also need to consider is that when you choose neutrality you choose the side of power when you take a step back and say oh i'm not involved or uh, but, you know good people on both sides you're choosing the status quo and you leave people vulnerable or unsupported and demonized and is so being um when, yeah when we start to unpack this, these problems are not solved yet they're definitely ongoing and as i said in the talk if if there's some issue out there in the world that exists some kind of discrimination or bias it is absolutely also at play within academia it's just on a just affecting fewer people but um but yeah these problems are not yet solved and i think that that is that is something also what you said at the beginning of of your point, Ilsa, that initially in the ne in the Netherlands was the forerunner on this on the of getting women into the workplace, and then after a while, what you need to also understand is that you don't write policy once and then it runs forever. You need to update things. You need to keep things, you know, um, keep things relevant and keep things fit for purpose. And I think that that is very important. So um, I guess yeah, that's another aspect to add to the uh, previous. The previous question about like you know why are there so few female researchers comparatively in the Netherlands despite how liberal things are maybe things just aren't moving a pace we need to update things and I think that this we had a very important juncture in time now where this is starting to it's starting to happen and we're starting to realize that again it's always about learning and unlearning when you know better you do better. Thank you, Tana. Um, Ilse, you did have a question on the chat, which I want to give you the possibility. Oh, I think that's that's several points back. I think maybe it's more sensible to continue this thread. Okay, so thank you. Okay, and then um, Antonio, would you like to add anything? No? Oh, so then I think because Ralph has already asked a question, I'd like to um, first go to Tanmoy and then Ralph, if that's okay. Tanmoy Laska. Yeah. Hi, Tanmoy. Nice Hi. to meet you. Thanks very much, Tana, for a wonderful talk. Uh, and congratulations on your new position. I'm excited to see uh, the changes um, and all the work that, uh, that's going to be done here. Uh, in that context, uh, thanks also for bringing up the concept of cultural taxation, where the people who are most marginalized are also often the ones that are doing a lot of the social justice, justice work to make uh, real change. 
So in addition to changing reward systems, which is something that we mentioned in your talk, um, and that's a very important, um, but very difficult change to make because it's an institutional change that has to happen at all levels. Do you think that there are any ways in, uh, say efficient ways in which uh, social justice um, advocates, uh, like many of the people on this call perhaps, could recruit allies to share in this burden? Um, yeah, absolutely. There's always a place for allies or co-conspirators, um, if you want to call them that. Again, like people are starting to phase out the word allies or the concept of ally, because we are now at a point where we need to take it that step further and start putting your money where your mouth is. Um, so I would say, yeah, um, there's definitely a space for allies. Just because it's not a problem that affects you doesn't mean that you can't work towards making that uh, problem go away, fixing it. And I would say, you know, let's use this as a call to arms. If you're an ally um, in any sense of the word and you want to, um, you know, work with us, please volunteer your time, get in touch. There's so many committees, there's so many activities that are going on. And I would also say that, um, again, another phrase that's starting to be phased out is privilege, but I'll use it here. If you have some kind of inherent privilege that you can leverage to help people, then absolutely also think about doing that. But again, question why you're doing it, question how and discuss with people how you're going to do it. Um, don't just charge in and try and fix people's problems. Um, again, as scientists, we want to, you know, we see a problem and we want a solution and we start planning how we're going to attack this problem, but maybe take a beat, step back, ask yourself, am I the right person to do this? Um, am I you know, how, how does it look if I just charge in or um, is there some other way that I can do things behind the scenes? And that is actually something that uh, decentering yourself, as we call it, and taking stock of, you know, your, as we call it, positionality um, in the, yeah, you know, in the specific case, um, how do you, how do you do that? And again, yeah, there's this issue of self-awareness that was brought up by Ralph and by others. It, um, I fear that a lot of people don't have that self-awareness. They've never needed to take a step back because we keep seeing it happen all the time. If you, again, I'm very active on social media, especially on Twitter. So um, there's this thing called uh, Manal Watch where it's always like, you know, there's like a few accounts dedicated to check if panel or an or white panel or, um, you know, like, are you the person that should be doing that? That's a question you need to ask yourself as an ally um, because you can't have a women in mathematics uh, seminar and then all four speakers are men. And you see these examples, they come up, you get caught out on social media all the time. Someone's going to post that screenshot. And I think that's also something that needs to be learned. And we can give some guidance for that, how to decenter yourself as an ally, um, but also still be an effective ally and be supportive and work towards the same goals. That's something that, we need to, more of us need to reflect on and we need some guidance on and that's definitely something we can um, fold into our activities um, so that people can have that support at their fingertips and, and start reflecting on that. Thanks very much for that. Uh, if I may have a quick follow-up. Um, so as a social justice advocate myself, I've worked to try to build some of this uh, into the institutions that I've been at. And I've often met with resistance where people say, why is this important? Why, do, why should we care? We should be more um, focused on delivering education or doing our research. So is there a way that we can change people's minds, people who are not on this call, so that everybody takes this seriously? So basically, how are we going to reach these hard to reach segments? So there's some evidence that shows that if you are a senior person, so like say at the professor level, um, other other senior people will make uh, will will take things more seriously if they see there's uh, you know someone at their level or a peer who is supporting it. So if this is coming only from students and postdocs, it's easy to dismiss by senior people. There's evidence to support that, and there's also evidence to show that PIs, for instance, in their group, as the head of a research uh, group you have a, obviously a lot of influence and talking about these issues upfront as part of your research meeting um, is very important. And I've had that experience um, in both the research groups that I've been in um, here in the Netherlands so far. So we had it by Samaya uh, Nisanke and also uh, Sarah Markov, where even issue arises, we talk about it. Um, we don't, you know, uh, we don't brush it under the carpet uh, because you don't you want to also make it known that in your research group it's a space where we can talk about this where people's 
feelings and um, and experiences are valued. Because at the end of the day, again, it always comes back to this, how are you expecting your employees or your uh, junior colleagues to do world-class research if they are also fighting these other battles that you refuse to acknowledge? So if you are a senior person, who had, who, you know, is doing this work, be vocal about it, be loud about it, initiate conversations with um, colleagues that maybe don't seem that engaged. Um, this change also, there's a lot of grassroots effort behind this. And the thing is, um, it's a very fun tick that you can do if you actually want to just play at doing EDI, where you encourage postdocs and students to do all of this work, and then they leave every two or three years, they, they go. And then they just, you know, you get a new crop in and they start a new, so nothing goes anywhere because it stays at the beginning stages. Whereas you with tenure or with a longer term contract, you know, can implement things on a five, 10, 20 year time scale that's going to take time to come to fruition, but you need that continue, you need that continuity. So this is again, another call to arms for people with clout, with influence, those that believe is of power. And indeed, those were the most to lose by making things more equitable and accessible. I know it's very difficult um, to kind of, you know, for some people, they might feel like they are rooting for their own downfall. But then again, you also need to have a conversation with yourself and ask yourself, why do you feel so threatened? Why is this uncomfortable for you? And, and you know, you're going to have to have some, yeah, some uncomfortable and awkward conversations with yourself. But uh, buy-in from everyone at every level, um, no matter where you are in the hierarchy, is, is incre incredibly important because you can't just rely on the people on short-term contracts or have, don't have the clout to actually change anything. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, Tamway. I, I'm, I'm looking at the time, so I think there are several comments on the chat and I'll move to Ralph um, in a second. But Veronica Allen, would you like to mention something? Because I think you've mentioned a very interesting point. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> I have to scroll back up. Um, yes, so so the thing is like when, when, we, when, when, when institutions focus on diversity and everything, they focus on race, and, and I would say, yes, yeah, sex, because they don't think about gender. <laughs> um, so um, I, I only really know my little corner, which is like pre-tenure moms. We're a very small corner, <laughs> but like nobody thinks about the invisible things. Nobody thinks about um, neurodiversity. So like, yeah, obviously people who are like not neurotypical, um, LGBTQ issues, like gender diversity, all of this, and, and then caring issues, like, and like coming from a low income background, all these things that, that are absolutely hurdles, they don't think about that. And those things are still discriminated against. You know, there's laws against it, but you know, you know, I apply for a postdoc position where 70 other people apply. Um, and you know, you don't look as good on paper because you can't write on paper, you know, I finished my PhD with two children. Like that people are gonna be like, no, you suck, <laughs> get out. Um, so like, there's this whole thing in my corner, at least, that you cannot tell anyone about your invisible problems. So the invisible problems don't get addressed. And so essentially, I don't know how to work with this. Like we, in, in the group that I, I, I co-organized, it's most of the members are in the US, so obviously it's sort of worse there, but it's still not great here. Um, and we're trying to work on how to get institutions to recognize that, you know, that they have to realize that everybody is not free all of the time. Um, and I basically, I guess I just wanted to know like how we shift to like diversity, inclusion, all of this stuff to things that are not just visible. Yeah. Okay. So that is a fantastic point. And um, again, I feel like the context of the Netherlands being so focused on gender equality takes away from other aspects as well, other um, positionalities. Um, and I would just like to state unequivocally that the approach that we are trying to implement with our EDI policies and our, um, and our activities, our interventions is very intersectional. It is first and foremost an intersectional approach. And we um, absolutely consider things like, you know, like, as I said in my talk, people with caring and fans, uh, family responsibilities, absolutely people with uh, disabilities, um, or disabled people as someone who has a disability, I prefer to, uh, I prefer um, 
uh, not to use person first language. It just sounds better to me to say disabled person. Um, so yeah, so just, um, just like, it's not just about, it's not just about sexism, um, there's, um, you know, and, and not just about racism, because again, that's very visible. When people look at me, they see a black woman, but I am also uh, someone who has mental illness. I'm also someone with, um, you know, um, I have a, for instance, I have a socioeconomic background that is unexpected for a lot of people. A lot too many people express surprise when they find out both my parents went to university because they assume as a black woman was born during apartheid in South Africa that I must be a first generation um, university student. I'm like, no, no. Like we make assumptions about people. There's things that we can't see about people. If you're a member of the LGBTQI plus community, do you feel comfortable being open about that? Um, so yeah, so intersectional, inter the intersectional approach to um, our work is, is very important. And it's one of the cornerstones of, of the way we're going to approach this, um, all of the work that we do. And that definitely includes um, all of the, uh, the, the points that you mentioned whether, uh, um, you know, the things that we, that, that again, that, that you very like to say that aren't visible, because some people have, um, you know, again, like even how we think of disability, you think of someone in a wheelchair, there's a lot of different ways to be disabled, um, even physically disabled, that aren't visible and obvious to people. And we need to start talking about that, we need to start being more, um, we need to start being more unequivocal about that, we do, again, we do the women and girls, in STEM, blah, 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 stuff a lot. But what about the fact that we are currently living through a mass disabling event? Uh, we are currently living through the first global pandemic of the 21st century, and many millions of people are going to be disabled as a result of this. And how do we respond to that? And this is something that, I actually don't know if I can talk about this, but let's just say in Vegas terms, I have worked already with um, senior members of the Dutch astronomy community, to start making uh, to start making this a part of documentation long term and long term policy that we um, hope to implement here in this country in our astronomy community that explicitly addresses things like um, accessibility for disabled people and um, what we call uh, changing labor practices. I know that a few countries are starting to, for instance, trial four day work weeks um, and how that impact uh, how would be perhaps something that's very useful for people who have major caring responsibilities um, in their personal life and all that kind of stuff and then again also comes down to funding bodies uh, maybe we should have for instance more part-time positions at the moment I am loving the dream I'm loving the literal dream I am I decided a few years ago that I don't want to be a professor in astronomy as most of us are not going to be professors in astronomy it's a literal pyramid scheme um, the overwhelming majority of us are not going to get professorships and I made that decision myself for my pride as well and uh, but I still want to do research but I also have other irons in the fire so I'm loving this dream where I have I get to do research part-time and I get to do EDI part-time and I have time in my week to work on my own personal ventures. And we need to stop seeing that kind of flexibility and stuff maybe being built into our, um, into our community and into our understanding of how science is done and how it can be done more efficiently, um, but also more accessibly. And not just this idea, again, this lone genius who all he does for 16 hours a day, or sorry, not he, all they do for 16 hours a day is do science and just like, you know, crush it and, and, and you know, they're this amazing person who, and who does nothing else. And instead of, you know, a more holistic approach to you as a person, just, you know, bring your whole self to work. And that includes being a parent, that includes being a disabled person, that includes being a racialized person. So, Tana, the Maya, I'm just going to say, we're just going to stop the live streaming now but keep going um okay. fine no no i'm going to actually bye youtube bye youtube i'm going to actually um close the session i think very because obviously it's been an hour and a half so i think everyone yeah. obviously in the interest of zoom fatigue oh, was okay veronica yeah. zoom it's fatigue uh, ralph would you like to ask the last question Um, I think you're on mute, Ralph. Yeah, I, it was not so much a question as a response to Tanmoy, like how do we how do we win hearts and souls? I would say first of all, let's be persistent because good ideas don't go away, uh, and 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 people with bad ideas tend to go away in that 
uh, in, in the face of that. Re remember Hans Bethe's old quip that science progresses by obituary. I, you know, some people will not learn new things, uh, but their ideas at some point simply don't get talked about anymore. So I, I think we have to prepare for the fact that it is a bit of a long haul because it requires cultural change and people's minds don't change overnight. Absolutely. But I mean, if I compare how we are now discussing this with how things were going 10 years ago, we're asking for such a committee as the NIAC to exist. Um, uh, simply, I mean, I know I asked the question less than 10 years ago and got told, no, that's not needed. And I, I think we've come a long way since then. And so, yeah, I think things are happening. And, and I think we may always, always, I think we always feel in some moods that it could move even faster. And that's probably true, but so already progress is not slow, I would say. Yeah, thank you so very thanks much. Thanks very Ralph. much, Tana, for, yeah. uh, for this talk and for um, helping us move along faster. Yeah, I, I think, um, thank you very much, Ralph, for I think leaving, ending on that note of hope and also a huge thank you to Tana for really, I mean, you know, really, I think an excellent um, talk as well as discussion. Thank you for answering all these questions as well as I have put um, the NIAC email as well as Tana's contact details, of course, if some of you want to reach out and also learn more about this relatively new committee. Um, that's been here for a couple of years, um, please do reach out. Um, obviously, please do join our webinars. As Tana mentioned, I think um, she is really now leading the charge. So I'm really, really honored and delighted to really, I think, pass you know, the NIAC leadership in terms of vision to Tana. So please do continue these discussions with Tana and of course, any of us. Thank you, Tana. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for um, yeah, for engaging. And uh, this is the beginning of um, an ongoing conversation. And I look forward to working with you all um, and hearing yeah, your thoughts and how we can make things better for all of us and for those who come after us. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Tana. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye.